Artistic Director of Bunnell Street Art Center, an art center that is situated on tribal land of um, Nichilna, Ninilchik Village Tribe, um, land that has been stewarded by thousands of years by Denine and Supiak people and the ancient Ketchumak people of this region. I'm so pleased uh, today to be joined by Teresa Waldstad, um, Indigenous artist and scientist, is going to speak with us today about her work um, as, a, as an artist with a degree in biology as well, two masters, and how um, her artistic inquiry and her scientific inquiry have um, converged into a fascinating proposal, which will be part of her residency at Bunnell Street Art Center in October. Welcome, Teresa. So, oh, before I begin, I want to thank the many teachers who actually did teach me. So I was born in Kodiak, but uh, my father was a fish and wildlife patrol officer with the state of Alaska. So we traveled a lot around the state of Alaska from Kodiak to Ketchikan to Prince of Wales Island, down to Homer and Fairbanks. And then when I started getting into college, I went into the sciences following along in my father and actually starting with fish and game. But everywhere I worked, everywhere I was stationed, I was able to actually go and talk with the indigenous communities in that area. And I was able to actually work with a wealth of uh, artists across the area and their masters in their field. Um, Kathleen Carlo is an Athabascan and she taught me a lot of my carving skills. Um, Deka Maynard, he's a Clinket artist. Um, he was actually my professor and assisted me with my master's uh, thesis at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I learned a lot of my form line techniques and such from Deka. Then, of course, uh, Alvin Amundsen and such. My work out of the Kodiak was uh, reflected by him, but he also started off at UAF as well. So a lot of my whimsical artwork and whatnot of reflecting culture as in the now came from Alvin. And then Glenn Simpson actually did help my master's thesis as well as Deka. And he was really into the research aspect. He really wanted to bring a practical explanation to why art is a certain form, but also making sure there was a cultural relevance to the creation of it. So a lot of those uh, pieces that he would bring in, as you see in the one image, he wanted people to have a tactile visual representation rather than just looking at books. He wanted people to realize it's tangible. So that actually was really influential later on in my work where I started studying regulations and laws and I would make visual representations. And that's part of a little bit of inspiration from Glenn Simpson. Then Abel Ryan was a fellow artist I worked for with actually at the University of Fairbanks for a while. And he's Shimshian. And it was very interesting to work with Abel because he started pulling out the very distinct nature of Alaska Native artwork and the dissimilarities and distinctions between subtle form line. So I started actually working with him more and looking at the differences between Haida, Klinka, and form line and the distinctions there. So being able to actually do more of a study of what makes something Klinka, what makes something Haida, and then also re realizing the representations and the cultural stories that came with a lot of the art representations. And he has a wonderful sense of humor, very whimsical. I think my favorite one was uh, the chill cat where it actually is an illustration of a cat laying on a chill cat blanket. <laughs> so he has a whimsical uh, attitude and a lot of his artwork is a uh, very formal and very traditional style, but still has a modern relevancy. Dolores Churchill, um, she actually was the first elder to train my mother. And she was the woman who taught me first how to weave in my entire life, my first art project was actually with Dolores, where she started teaching me to weave cedar bark birds. And the reason she taught me how to weave cedar bark birds was because I was annoying my mother so much while she was attending Dolores classes for weaving. 
So rather than trying to get me a babysitter or something like that, Dolores said, no, no, no. You get the children in and you teach them. Little things, little steps, but you never send them away. You invite them into the culture and you teach them how to weave. It, little birds, and that was the first thing I started weaving is so I could stop annoying my mother so she can actually learn how to weave a basket. <laughs> so it's always this inviting and knowledge that comes from her. And she's such a patient, beautiful artist. I've yet to get to the mastery of her baskets. And it's just, I guess one way of saying it is patience. She taught me a lot of patience. To get to her level, it just takes years and years of practice. And every mistake is a little data point that you're adding towards becoming a better artist. So yes, your first basket's gonna be lumpy, but that's the point, you made your first basket. It's a start. Nathan Jackson was actually a very interesting individual. Um, I knew him when I was in Ketchikan. I just knew him as one of the local carvers. He is a pinnacle of a lot of the native elders in Southeast, especially around in the Ketchikan area. But I always knew him as a down to earth, wonderful guy who was a great dancer. And he enjoyed going in and critiquing and talking about form line. So when I was taught form line from Deka with Clinkett, he told me to actually go and talk to Nathan Jackson. And Nathan Jackson actually went in and started talking more about the distinguishing features and how each artist in Clinkett form line has their own distinct signature. Um, you can even go up to some of his totem poles and you can see the grooves that his ass make and he can actually tell you how they made it, the angle that they made it. And he said, subtle things are signatures. Subtle aspects of your art is what makes you you. He's like, you have to make sure that there is an individual and while you represent your culture, you are also representing you as an artist. So it was always kind of interesting to him to go in and laugh a little bit about the dissimilarities between form line and whatnot. And he always said Clinkett made bold lines or bold statements with their form line. And that's why his is very bold and very nice thick lines. So that was one of those comments of going in and saying that you're supposed to have subtle differences. You copy the masters, but when you become an artist, you need to make sure you have your own distinction as well. Now, Evelyn Vanderhoop, uh, she was the one who taught me how to do uh, raven's tail weaving. And that actually was with the Toad and Heritage Center down in Ketchikan. Wonderful woman as well, and very, very knowledgeable. I remember uh, with her, with my weaving, she kept on telling me, I'm too tense. When you're weaving uh, raven's tail and such, you need to make sure that when you're weaving, you have a relaxed tense when you're actually doing the twining. And my warps and webs would actually start bunching together. And that's just because I was too tense. Mm -hmm. Again, I was working for SATs, getting into college and applying for all those applications. And you could see my weaving, instead of being nice and straight, it started bowing in. And she said, my weaving was a reflection of my stress level. Mm -hmm. And I needed to actually relax and be myself. And <laughs> I still have that little piece that sticks in like this for my stress. <laughs> But again, she would emphasize with the same as Dolores is like patience. When you're making art, you basically are coming in and expressing yourself. And that also means expressing your emotions. If you're stressed, you're gonna make stressed art. <laughs> so yeah, actually, and Mary Lee was actually her. another artist and she was a wonderful one. So she started teaching me skin sewing and that was actually quite interesting because my father, again, working with uh, Alaska State Troopers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I had an opportunity to actually work with a lot of fur bears, but I'd never really done a lot of skin sewing. So she started me off working with very basic skin sewing with calf skin and whatnot. And she started showing me these beautiful geometrical patterns that are found throughout a lot of the Nupiak style art. and it was interesting because a lot of the raven's tail I learned with uh, Vanderhoop was very geometrical of the raven's tail. So I started finding these patterns and started talking for a little more about the different styles and what they represent and finding the history behind it. She's very passionate when it comes to the history and the styles and the families being represented in regalia. 
So it was a very fun to actually start working with fur and actually working with hide to be able to get this materials done. But wealth of knowledge. And it was very nice to talk with her in a very informal setting because she would sometimes come up to the University of Fairbanks and do workshops. So she was one of those workshop uh, artisans that were able to come in and talk about artwork. And she's also a wonderful seal skinner. <laughs> So it was always impressive to see how fast she's able to skin seals. And just again, it's that time and patience, but also learning how to harvest the materials. Now, Pauline at Carlo um, at the Baskin, she actually taught me beading. Um, when I went up to uh, the University of Fairbanks area, she did actually come into the Native Art Studio. And when I first started out going and getting my master's in science, Paul Dean actually was one of those people that would come in and sit down and was a quiet elder in the Native Arts Studio. But I took Native Arts classes during my science programs because I needed something to relax. I needed to feel like I was accomplishing something. And with each bead I put down and stitched on, I felt like I was accomplishing something. When you're doing Excel files and spreadsheets, doing forecasting of fisheries, sometimes you're kind of sitting there going like, well, I've made a graph. I guess that was my daily accomplishment, but with beading, there was this sense of, of, I guess one way of saying it is a sense of monumental effort. It takes time, but you can see the buildup. You can see what you're able to accomplish at the end. And yes, it takes hours and such to do work for beading, but just the beautiful nature of accomplished piece is one of the things that Paulding really showed. And she had such wonderful beading styles. And she was just such a sweet woman that actually worked and helped out and gave me a lot of hints, especially for the different types and styles of beading. And that was something I never really thought about was the different techniques and styles of conching and other stuff that Paulding actually shared with me, specifically with uh, regalia and leather work. And of course, one of the artists I have to mention, I mentioned her briefly before, was actually my mother. And yeah, the reason I actually got into Native art was through my mom. And that was because she always made it accessible. She always wanted to talk to these art artists, always introducing me to these artists. But she also wanted to make sure that I always was brought with her. Anytime she took a lot of these uh, classes that were being taught at the Tone Heritage Center at UAF, she introduced me and brought me in so I can learn with her. And even now she still does some weaving and she still does a lot of Raven's Tale, but she always encouraged me. And it's one of those interesting things of thinking back and realizing that if I didn't have my mom, I wouldn't actually have that uh, aspect of bridging science and art. So it's always interesting to go back and realize how much I actually have to thank for my mom for just inviting me and actually encouraging me in the art field. And yeah, these are just some of the many artists. I have way too many, but these are the ones that I've worked with uh, quite significantly as in either official work studies or even helped me for my education and even worked with me to become a master's for native arts. And these are the ones that I really do want to thank, but I have so many more. And that would take an hour just to thank them all. <laughs> Teresa, you, you mentioned that your mother's family background is Salish oh. and uh, Kootenai? Yes. So I guess one way of saying it is I am a modern indigenous woman. Um, when I mean that, it means I'm indigenous, but I'm not Alaskan native. I was born on Kodiak, but... Um, my grandfather actually is Coastal Salish in Kootenai. Uh, his family is actually still on the Montana Native Reservation down. And it's interesting when you start seeing it because half of his family lives in Canada, the other side lives in the reservation in Montana, but he came all the way up into Alaska and became one of the pioneers for North Pole. So he actually was an industrial welder and came into the North Pole area and was helping a lot with uh, the construction of Ielsen, but even helped out with the pipeline and reconstruction of Valdez. But it's always interesting when you look back and reflect that there is a distinction that I'm part of a federally recognized tribe of Ketchikan Indian community. So I'm 
part of the Alaska Native tribe, but I'm indigenous American. So it's one of those interesting dualities of realizing that I'm not really of one culture, but as I traveled around the state of Alaska with my father, I was able to actually study from a wealth of a Alaska Native elders across the state of Alaska and being able to actually learn about those art pieces and their culture and their history. And it really did influence me realizing that my grandfather really didn't have much when he came up to Alaska. He focused on industrial welding and focused on raising all seven of his children. So it's always interesting to go back and look at that and realize that there is a distinction. I am part of a federally recognized tribe but I'm indigenous. And in the end, it's that study of going into and looking at what I am. Yes, this is actually a very beautiful photograph of both Deka and Kathleen Mayner. Uh, so you have Deka Mayner and, and uh, Kathleen Carlo. This was actually a workshop talking about Athabascan carving. And this was at the University of Alaska Fairbanks in the Native Arts Center. And you can see me down at the very bottom corner and the Athabascan mask in that one was actually a very funny one. That was a uh, dual management. And it specifically is actually a reflection of US Fish and Wildlife Service where I actually doubled the images on there of all the hands of government around it. So even when I was doing workshops with Kathleen, she encouraged me to express myself and express my background. And one of those was me working around dual management between the state of Alaska and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service when I was stationed in Kodiak. The weir itself was uh, in the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge, but the small little isthmus was for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game to operate one of the larger sockeye salmon operations in that area. So it got to be a joke of I had to make sure where I could dig my outhouse to make sure it was in the permitted area for where state was. And there was this dual management of like, gravel yards and whatnot. So it was always interesting where she encouraged me to reflect that, encourage who I am. Now this piece right here is actually very interesting. This is a reflection of uh, looking at what is contemporary and what is traditional. So this is a conditional, and again, I'm fusing the words, a conditional art. <laughs> it's a fusion of traditional and contemporary work. So you have more of a traditional uh, red and yellow cedar bark uh, woven hat. And that's one of the first hats I wove. And you can see all the bumps and everything else along those lines. And it took me a while to do that, but it's very traditional. You can see the rim is slightly uh, uh, darker red. That's actually the red cedar with the ending. So you can see the differences between the red and yellow cedar bark. But I wanted to try making a very traditional twined cedar bark hat. And this is very similar to what you'd find for the clink at the hide in the Shimshian style. And that cedar bark was harvested out of Prince of Wales Island with my mother out of Craig. Now the hat over onto the right hand side is a contemporary one. And that actually is using canvas linen and seine twine. Now the pattern that you see in the red there is actually a herringbone pattern that I modified slightly. So it's kind of a tongue in cheek talking about uh, fishing nets and using herringbone patterns, but it's all uh, contemporary because the materials are different. But also the reason I made the contemporary hat is when I was traveling down for celebration to Juneau, it's very hard to check those hats through baggage through Alaska Airlines. They're very hard, they're very bulky and you don't want them to get crushed. The canvas linen and the same twine you can take the hat and ball it up into a little ball, put it in your jacket and whatnot, go through Alaska Airlines. And when you get there, you could just fluff it out, smooth it out and you got a hat. And that's kind of the contemporary one. The same is true of this piece here. This is another canvas linen. And this was actually a very interesting pattern that I started working on. This is called Clinket Diamonds. And I wanted to focus on the box of daylight. This is a pattern that uh, Vanderhoop actually taught me. And what was interesting was uh, I wanted to actually stack the box of daylight together. And I realized by putting it on top, I actually made a second pattern design. 
So you can see the diamonds coming out between the squares or the repeated boxes. So depending on how the hat moved and how you looked at it, it would give you an optical illusion. So this one was me playing around with the canvas linen, but again, also exploring patterns and the designs that can actually make it uniquely my own. You can see again, the repeating of the herringbone design, but then I also made a nice little checkerboard pattern design as well. And the checkerboard was another influence that actually came from Anupiak style patterns. So this is me starting to reflect and actually develop and look at patterns across the state of Alaska and explore how they would actually model and fit into the art form. Next slide. And that actually applied to a lot of my other artwork. So this is me again, working towards doing a traditional woven bottles. So you have checkers. Uh, this one is just a checkered series, checkered one and checkered two. And I'm weaving traditionally over top of bottles. Now, the next one that you see here is actually when I started exploring more of my whimsical aspects. Uh, this is a Coke Classic. And this actually was a traditional Lutic style woven basket. I was able to actually get a hold of beach grass and I was able to make a traditional uh, rye grass, the uh, rye beach grass woven a Lutic style bottle. And uh, I'm not sure if you guys remember uh, New Coke and Coke Classic. So uh, Coca-Cola released a new change to their uh, recipe and it was called New Coke. Um, very few people liked it. So they brought back uh, the original formula and called it Coca-Cola Classic because everybody loves a classic. And this was my tongue in cheek of looking at my artwork and like, well, everybody likes traditional classic art and actually weaving a traditional style rye grass alutic bottle as a Coca-Cola bottle that was classic Coca-Cola. This was actually bringing in additional work and materials. So this over on to the left, you can see again, I'm trying to apply some of the traditional materials and for the bottle on the left-hand side. And you can see a little bit of very thinly spliced yellow cedar bark. And that was kind of me going as far as I can for thinning it down to make the cedar bark actually mimic very similarly to rye glass. And I wanted to actually figure out how I can actually change the materials back and forth and see if I can actually get the reflection of what the materials could do, but also kind of a whimsical appearance of the form style. After again playing around with a lot of the materials, I started actually just enjoying the presence and appearance of the materials themselves. This is a study of a cedar uh, study of birch bark, and again traditional birch bark baskets. I kind of started looking at them, thinking, "Oh, how do you make them? What's the best materials? When do you harvest them?" And actually started really just appreciating the natural materials themselves. Looking at a lot of the baskets in museums, I started actually going through and realizing that those beautifully cut designs were actually modern scissors that actually have the patterns onto them. And you can see a little bit of up onto the top, but you can also see just the appreciation for the natural curve and the moss and the lichen that grows on those materials. So this was one of my first studies of looking at contrast and such of the natural materials where you actually get the focal point being the natural material as you see on the tree and the backdrop actually being what's within the tree itself. So next slide. This is taking it a little bit further. Now, if you look at the cedar bark uh, piece that's on the right hand side, this is actually an interesting piece. The cedar bark mat, you can see the differences between the red and the yellow cedar. Again, the red is a little bit more darker as compared to the yellow and it's all plated woven mat. Now, the frame around it is interesting in that that actually is how my mom collects cedar bark. When we would go down to Southeast Alaska and we'd be able to start stripping trees and whatnot, she would actually put it around her arm. So from about right here to here and wrap it like you would do a cord for a boat or so, like the rope from a boat. And she'd let it dry that way before she would process it. So the frame that you're seeing there is actually uh, one of those pieces that I got from my mom that she gave me as a gift for my master's in native art so I'd have materials for weaving. And I love the natural form and gifting of materials that you'd be able to make artwork. So I actually decided to want to reflect that natural materials and the reflection of process. 
So when you're looking at materials and you're looking at making it into artwork, I wanted to reflect the many steps that are involved. So then you can see that natural piece coming around with the beat, with the nice woven mat that I encouraged in the center with the edge is still available so you can see how it's made. But that kind of reflected over into my uh, non-timber byproduct material piece. And that actually was a reflection of all the permits and such that is actually done for non-timber plant materials for the state of Alaska and natural resources. So it's interesting when you start looking at permitting for processing and hunting and gathering is because if you start going in and harvesting materials for commercial artwork, you do need to be permitted. And I really didn't start digging into this until I tried to get my master's in native arts and realized, well, I'm going to start doing these as commercial. I need to be regulated and I need to start looking over in these laws in more details for plants. So everything from ryegrass to cedar bark, to spruce roots, to diamond willow, to even birch bark and even plain logs that fall on the ground. All of those are regulated and permitted. So I wanted to actually reflect those permitted materials, but also the raw natural aspect that it's not just the harvest, it's not just the artwork, it's the materials being out and harvested as part of the culture. And that's kind of a reflection of this piece here, reflecting again of all the materials that are needed to be permitted for harvest and actually participation and involvement in the culture. And Teresa, tell us what some of the materials are. I recognize the rye grass and the cedar bark, and maybe birch. What else are we seeing in that image? The rope coil looking thing right there, that actually is spruce roots. Mm -hmm. So when my mom and I would actually go gather spruce roots, um, we would actually do that uh, not too far from the city of Craig, and there's a little baseball park area, and that region and they usually get sandy beaches and you can get the nice long pieces of uh, spruce roots. You usually try getting them nice and thick but that's actually relatively clean because when you first get them you need to strip this, the bark off the roots otherwise it's not really weavable. So you can see that material there it's all the coil and whatnot of the spruce roots but it already has the bark removed. So it's about ready to start splitting and weaving. And then you can see the diamond willow on the top there of that very distinctive diamond aspect onto it. Nice. Now this piece right here, this actually is a little tongue in cheek and started reflecting a little more of my family, especially on my father's side. So both my grandfather and my father were wildlife enforcement officers in the state of Alaska. So before statehood, my family has been involved with wildlife management and laws and regulations. And this here is actually reflecting a little more on the National Eagle Repository Bank. So for those who aren't familiar, um, you do have the Migratory Bird Act and you do have the Bald Eagle Regulatory Act. Now those prevent individuals from going out and harvesting eagles and utilizing their feathers and parts and whatnot. But you do have individuals that are of native ancestry who can actually still be able to go out and utilize eagle parts from claws to tails to feathers. And the way you're able to get access to those materials is by actually applying for an application to the National Eagle, the Bald Eagle Repository Bank. And they will permit you to have eagles and permit to have the possession of them. And they will send you eagle parts and feathers that you're permitted to have. Now, the reason I know about this bank is when as a, as a kid, my father would actually go and pick up roadkill bald eagles, eagles that ran into buildings or whatever, any natural cause of death for a bald eagle. He would process the bird and he would actually send it to the repository bank. And as a young kid, it was always interesting for me to go and pick feathers off the beach. And my dad would tell me, he's like, no, you, you can't do that. Like, but I'm native. Well, you gotta officially go to the bank and apply to be able to pick up that feather. And then they'll send you feathers. Like, but dad, I'm holding the feather right now. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. I have to send it all the way down to the bank. They will process it and then you can get it. I'm like, well, I get this feather back? Oh, probably not, but you'll get something. Hmm. <laughs> wow, and where is the bank located? I believe it's in Colorado. Wow. But um, it's all run from the US Fish and Wildlife Service and calling down and talking of them a little bit. It was always a hoot to be able to ask a little more about details and where these eagles are coming from, because it's not only uh, 
bald eagles, they also do golden eagles too. So it was always interesting to talk and realize that some of the eagles that my father sent to this bank were being distributed across the US. So this uh, regalia piece here, which is a button blanket, is actually kind of a tongue in cheek about that bank. So you can see form line, they represent both Clinket Haida and Shimshian. So you can see the individual feathers are having slightly different form lines, but they're all eagle feathers around the border. And then you have three forms that are coppers. And the three coppers are representing again, Clinket Haida and Shimshian. So trying to show Southeast as a collective, as one large group of Alaskans. But again, when you're looking at the copper and such, it's a tongue in cheek because the new penny that came out actually features the American copper shield. So when I saw that and I remembered the bank, I thought it was so much of a whimsical pattern that I had to put the copper shield of America on coppers, which were a traditional symbol of wealth and prestige in Clinket Haida and Shimshian culture and make a reference to the Eagle Repository Bank. Hmm. And that's what this piece right here is a whimsical tongue in cheek discussion about permitting to have bald eagle feathers through a repository bank. Wow. And that's what this piece is all reflecting on. And that's when I started really getting into that idea of reflecting both my mother's knowledge and my artistic knowledge, but then also my father's background and my cultural experiences being on with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Fish and Game, because you hear about this hand of the government, but I grew up with these guys. I remember talking at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service guy that was picking up the dead bald eagle with my dad when he's babysitting us over the weekend, and he joking like, well, this is a ripe one. Where'd you get it? Cannery. Oh, okay. He's going to need a lot more Dawn dishwasher soap to get him prepped up. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that was it. It's just they needed to go through and process and clean these uh, materials so they can actually send it out across the entire U.S. And my dad, in a roundabout way, was contributing to traditional Al Alaska Native culture by making sure there were enough Alaskan bald eagles being shipped at this bank so they had access to a lot of these feathers. So it, it's always kind of interesting. This is another piece that's kind of interesting. This is actually looking at what is the difference between handicrafts and fine art. So when you're looking at the definition of handicrafts, so Alaska Native handicrafts are defined as something that has been significantly modified of the natural materials to significantly increase its monetary value. And that was something that was very interesting along the lines because many of the Alaska Native elders I talked to for the creation of art they never really talked about increasing monetary value. It was always to make art to express yourself. There wasn't a need to actually significantly modify. It was this idea of creating art that reflects things. And then it got into that debate and discussion about, well, is there a difference between Alaska Native fine art and Alaska Native handicrafts? So I started looking and starting to make pieces of art where they would start reflecting the differences in the distinction. This piece right here is a tanned uh, wolverine uh, paw that I actually turned into a very nice little pouch. You would see these tiny pouches very common within the Athabascan culture where they'd be able to have these beautiful pieces and bags. Sometimes they would actually take the entire animal hide itself, the paws, the legs, and actually make a bag completely out of it. So you would have those paws and heads and such hanging off the bag. And they were always just so beautiful, I thought. And this is one of those pieces of trying to reflect a traditional artwork that can be defined as fine art, but not a handicraft. And what's really cool about this one, uh, what's really cool about this one is because it's a fur bearer, I can sell it. And the reason for that is under state law and such, you can actually sell pieces of fur bears and whatnot as hide scraps and whatnot. So in this one, it actually is able to be sold. Now, it's not a trophy animal, it's a fur bear. If it was a brown bear, I would not be able to sell it because it's considered trophy. So this is when I started looking at animals and how they're represented and how they're classified as well. So the next slide. 
this is going into classification and looking at materials. So then I actually took an old optometry uh, dust file drawer. So all the different little pieces that you see for filing were used for putting in and developing glassware and whatnot. And I actually started going into my sciences and I started trying to categorize what I actually use for making artwork. And you can see all the tiny little specimen jars along the outside. You can see my beading, my skin sewing. I even have some uh, fish skin that I actually started weaving and making bottles and baskets with. I have several different species of fur from muck socks into fox to beaver. Then going into the different specimens and designs of little bottles. So everything from uh, cedar bark to rye glass to canvas linen, artificial sinew, beeswax. And I started going through and evaluating what I actually utilize. Again, a little bit of tongue in cheek, you can see my pennies in there again, because I realized how much of my work involved pennies and drilling holes to turn them into buttons. So it was kind of a tongue in cheek evaluation of what do I actually have that I'm hoarding as an artist to make art. So if I would classify my art as a junk drawer of what I could actually grab as materials, what would it look like? And this is a reflection of what do I have? What do I need to make art? And what is the variety of materials? And it was interesting to start seeing a visual representation of what I create, but also the materials to make art. The science in a sense behind it. Exactly. And that kind of brings into this piece right here. So when you're looking at watershed management, a watershed involves everything that comes into a single river that basically feeds into a valley area. You can have multiple rivers, you can have multiple lakes into one main ecosystem that flows all the way from the mountains down to the ocean. So when we're talking about landscape management, you start realizing there's multiple jurisdictions and these jurisdictions run the gambit between not only the dual management of state and feds, but within those jurisdictions, you have variety of different styles and boundaries. So here, I wanted to look at the jurisdiction of how things change from running from a mountain lake all the way down to the ocean and how you have all these different management agencies manage a single river. You have US Forest Service up in the mountain range going over to the state of Alaska, Department of Natural Resources. Then you have the National Park Service. Then you have the Alaska Department of Fish and Game then U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Borough of Land Management, and then NOAA. And that was the inter interesting thing, is realizing walking from the ocean all the way up into the mountains, you're touching all and flowing through all of these different managers that actually do have their own definitions of how they regulate and manage their landscape and the natural resources that are utilized for making art and how they have their own interpretations and own distinctions between significantly modified, handicrafts, utilizations, permitting, residency requirements. And it got to this interesting aspect of a single river, as you travel along that area to look for natural resource materials for art, you're transversing this landscape. And it's a landscape not just of a watershed, but a landscape of jurisdictional management. And that's what this piece is called navigating a ambiguous waters. This is a detailed piece and the entire thing is actually beaded. It took me about two years to do and that was quite a bit of work. <laughs> but you can see the detailed piece with the badges that are reflecting Fish and Game, National Park Service, again, I'll, State of Alaska, Natural Resources, or DNR, and then Forest Service. So the whole thing itself is beaded. It's a, and it's a reflection of a burden belt. And for those who don't know what a burden belt is, uh, back in the day for Athabascans, a lot of their wealth and prestige reflecting on their wealth was actually beads and whatnot that they would put on their regalia. And one of the biggest pieces that you would see were those baby belts. And the baby belts were also known as burden belts. The baby belt is more in kind for children and whatnot, especially for babies as they're infants to hold them. But they would also do burden belts for carrying burdens and whatnot. So again, this is a tongue-in-cheek witticism of the burden of navigating regulatory theory. Wow. 
Teresa, it's so incredible to, you know, hear your um, rather patient and detailed exposition <laughs> of the incredibly burdensome um, regulatory structure that Indigenous artists have to maneuver to make work. It, tell us how that experience kind of informed a proposal for a residency at Bunnell and the object of that residency in terms of developing a manual, beginning with a discussion and developing a manual. Well, again, when I started looking at my master's and actually developing and working towards it, I realized there really wasn't a good manual because when I started focusing on becoming a commercial artist, they do have some nice reflections, but I still was a personal use artist. So several of my materials I would only use for personal use and I never really intended to sell those materials. They were usually given out as gifts to families and friends. But I also wanted to be able to go through and utilize some of the materials that I had for commercial artwork, especially for my upcoming gallery exhibition in my UAF exhibition where I would have to be able to sell some of the pieces. And then realizing I had to make the distinction between the materials and then even my in artistic intent when I was making the artwork. And that was something I never really thought about until I started my master's realizing, wait, whoa, whoa, before I made the piece, because a lot of these pieces I would make and like, oh, well, that's pretty. Well, you know, I could sell this. And realizing, oh, wait, did I use any of these materials from A, B or C that would prevent it? And then realizing it's a mix because when I would actually put cedar bark in a bag, I did not really think I needed to distinguish what GPS location the cedar bark was harvested from. And yes, you some of those areas you need to do so. Some of those permitted and everything else has to be distinguished. And I really didn't reflect on that because I came from art as a personal use. I made all my artwork as a reflection of my culture for my own use, but also as gifts to reflect my culture to my family and friends. And then realizing I had to have this dimensional shift to becoming a commercial artist, but I still wanted to be a personal use artist. I still wanted to create art for just the sake of art creation. And realizing there was this regulatory manual that comes into the details for commercial artwork, but there was a distinction between personal use and commercial use. And that started really getting the reflection of what was the distinction? And I ran into that literally my last year of my master's thesis because I was trying to create as much artwork as I can and then looking through the regulatory and being inspired by my culture and my family and then realizing, oh, there really isn't like a a regulatory manual or a guide or such that would help guide individuals into a lot of this work. And realizing the degree of subtlety between definitions and laws. Um, a good example is the degree is significantly modified for US Fish and Wildlife Service and then uh, NOAA Fisheries Management. So when we're talking about marine mammals, uh, marine mammals are not managed by one agency. You have polar bears, you have walruses, and you have uh, sea otters. They're managed by US Fish and Wildlife Service. But then you also have whales, you have belugas, you have all these uh, like seals, so the ice seals and such. They're managed by NOAA fisheries and they define significantly modified very differently. So when you're looking at U.S. Fish and Wildlife, they take the degree as significantly modified very far. You have to make sure that it does not reflect a lifelike representation of the animal. It has to be significantly changed to a degree that significantly increases its monetary value. Now for uh, NOAA, when they started looking at it, they kind of reflected more on uh, native art as more of a utilization of subsistence byproducts. So when they are looking at a lot of those materials, they're realizing you're harvesting the animal for food, but at the same time, utilizing it for cultural expression. So most of their definitions of significantly modified is like for baleen, it's polished and cleaned. The piece is still a nice strip of baleen and it's polished and it's cleaned, but it still has that artistic value 
an intrinsic value of being baleen. You don't have to cut it and carve it into a boat. You can actually go in and do beautiful polishing and it's fine art and it's significantly modified. But when you're looking at ivory, you can't just sign your name on a piece of ivory. It has to be significantly modified. And that difference is there is what really started inspiring me when I started asking them, how much more modification do I need? At what point does it become distinct? Where do I meet that threshold? Where is that threshold? And they didn't really quite have an answer. They said, you know it when you see it. And it got to this question of, so how do I reflect that? How do I actually get into that degree of significant modification? And that started looking more of talking of these managers and talking of the, a lot of the biologists as well. And that kind of spurred this residency and this discussion of actually talking of the artists and such, because again, I'm an indigenous native artist and I am second generation coastal dwelling as stated under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And I'm part of a federally recognized tribe in Alaska, but I don't meet the blood quantum. So there's this interesting aspect of me sitting at the Native Art Center and looking over these regs. And I had this one uh, poor student coming over and like, all right, this is going to be a weird question. But I remember you talking about Marine Mammal Protection Act and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and I'm an ivory carver. But I'm here in Fairbanks. I'm like, well, yeah, this is the Native Arts program. Is Fairbanks coastal dwelling? I mean, do they do they check where I'm currently living because I'm half the year in Fairbanks? but the other half I'm living home on the, in Bethel. And it was that moment of me sitting there going, I just don't know. <laughs> we have an ivory carving station to allow people to actually do ivory carving. It's the only master's program in native arts in the US right now. And is it in Fairbanks? And is that the problem for ivory carving? It was that question of like, okay, I think we need to call a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service officer and have a quick check and make sure that, okay, um, is it just blood quantum? Is that what determines it? And reading of our Marine Mammal Protection Act started causing this conversation about these regs and whatnot to make sure that we wanted to be compliant. We wanted to be involved in it. And that started that conversation. Yeah. Let's um look at your... Um you know, your survey that yeah. you've created to help, you know, tease out who might be interested in these issues that you're surfacing and how as a, um, as an artist and as an organization, we can support, you know, artist access to traditional resources. So you, mm -hmm. you created a survey and um, we're helping you disseminate this. This is, um, you know, anybody could participate, but of course mm -hmm. you're specifically trying to support, you know, indigenous artists, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the interesting aspect is I do have a lot of individuals that are indigenous artists, but we also have individuals that just want to learn how to make traditional art who actually want to make it for personal use and want to learn how to do this. So I do actually have individuals that just want to learn because they're biologists for that area. They actually manage wolves and they want to learn how people actually use the rough and such for making parkas because they're managing wolves and they're managing for fur quality as well. So I have some biologists that are interested to learn about native art because they're managing the natural resource materials. So it's an interesting aspect of the conference where I'm bringing in both sides of the coin. They actually talk about indigenous art, their utilization, their permitting and management, not necessarily as just a feds and state conversation to native artists, but native artists learning from managers and managers learning about the art and how they're utilized and even how we actually harvest them. And that's kind of what's starting this. The first question is, of course, looking at if they're interested in the conference itself, specifically about natural artistic resources and the management of natural art. So the next question is kind of looking at right now in the day of COVID. So some people are actually interested in attending, but they're maybe more interested in looking at a statewide conference. So looking more of at a state idea and being held on Zoom. 
So getting an idea of whether or not they're interested on in a statewide conference in general. And the next question, of course, is looking more of a personal regional conversation. So more focusing intently on a regional area and looking at the natural artwork that is being made and the materials being offered in those areas and the managers from that area. And that's for a small conference held in Homer. The next one actually is looking at either a working group or a discussion panel. And for that, the working group is gonna really look at the basic regulatory manual for artists. And they're the ones that are gonna try working and developing a manual. So very kind of informal manual for access for natural resources, navigating both state and federal laws. And that report that they're gonna be utilizing is gonna review those current barriers to cultural expression, utilizing natural artistic and resource and making potential solutions. So it's a good way for artists to come in and start talking about, well, what is a barrier? The discussion panel is gonna focus on both the state and federal natural resources managers, but also have a discussion between those managers and Alaska Native tribal representatives, Alaska Native cultural bearers and indigenous artists. So they can ask those questions referring to how much of a degree of modification, what permit do I need? Can I harvest in this one area? Or how do I harvest? Or what's the resource doing in my particular area? Is it sustainable? And having those discussions to be able to ask those questions. And then kind of gauging people's experience and background. What is your area expertise, knowledge and practical experience that you have for presenting to the conference? So what can you share at the conference? The next question is kind of looking more at your job title and profession. So are you with a federal and state agency? Are you with the Alaska Native tribe? Are you with a museum or even an art gallery? So what is your profession? What do you do as a living? The next slide is actually gauging more of knowledge and such with Alaska Native arts and crafts laws in Nilka and Anxa, but also looks at natural artistic resource permitting. So non-timber forest products, special forest products, fur bears, big game animals, personal use or subsistence, CITES, migratory bird, marine mammal. So for the discussion panel, we can actually bring in representatives who have experience in those areas and even can discuss the recent changes in regulatories and laws and permitting for those regions too. So then get everybody up to date as well. So it's this idea of what can you share? And for a lot of Alaska Native artists, it's what type of art do you make? What natural artistic materials do you utilize? Are you an elder or a cultural bearer? And what knowledge or expertise you can actually share with us? It's a good way to start looking at traditional and contemporary materials. An example of that that's always been interesting to me is looking at stellar sea lion whiskers. They're always hard to get, but a native elder out of Kodiak uh, found the broom, the plastic brooms, if you put shoe polish on them, and you clean them, they look like stellar sea lion whiskers and you don't need to be permitted. And it's one of those knowledge that you're able to share. And I still remember like, I never thought of it, but that's such an ingenious way. And that's one of these things is looking at these native artists and elders and ways they kind of go around the regs and, and how they can share and express their expertise. So then looking at when we can actually start holding it in October, um, we're looking at maybe a Friday or Saturday, a weekend, weekdays, and kind of getting an idea of when people are available. And then the final question is actually looking at dates and such that are available for participation, both on Zoom or even on conference. And that's kind of what I'm gauging is an interest in participation, what they want to participate in, but also looking at the areas of expertise. So see if there's anything that's lacking or if there's more interest in a particular area and looking at the diversity of representatives across not only regulatory, but also artists themselves or even tribes and just modern and contemporary artists. So it's gonna be interesting to look at and bring everybody in the same room and talk and discuss these pieces and even the art that's currently being created in this modern world. Thank you so much, Teresa. I will um, paste a link to the survey um, for you. anybody who um, is interested in the um, Facebook, you know, um, announcement about this talk, and also on Vanell's Facebook page. Um, 
I'm, I'm just really curious to know um, if your hope is that this kind of discussion can affect policy. It seems, it, it seems really excessive and burdensome to me to think about what indigenous artists have to navigate. And do you think that by having um, policymakers and by having agency, you know, regulatory agency representatives present, there is any hope for um, uh, less restrictions eventually on access to resources for artists? And yeah, I think so. There has been conversations and there have been changes. Uh, the Morton policy is a good example of that where it's starting to allow individuals for subsistence harvest of migratory birds to actually start utilizing certain species that are harvested during subsistence during the spring for commercial artwork. And that actually came through discussions with individuals who were the US Fish and Wildlife Service that were dealing with these migratory birds. And that Morton policy only came about because people had these conversations with these regulatory authorities. And it's one of those interesting things that you look back with Alaska's history and having conversations with these regulatory agencies is how we do have change and how we actually find out how we can better manage too. Um, we talk about the duck in and such and how Alaska actually changed a migratory bird treaty act between multiple nations to allow us to actually harvest during the spring. So even that actually came about for having conversations and actually getting people to listen to that. And that's part of it is sometimes you have these uh, biologists who just want to know how it's utilized. They even write in the reports about how the resource is being utilized in certain areas. And they want to know that people are actually coming into these regions. They want to know that people are utilizing these materials. They want to know how it's changed over the years too. Has there been an increase in demand? Is there a decrease in demand? Have things changed? And they want to provide for ability, but they won't know that until they talk to the artists and they talk to how things have changed over the years. So it's this want to get people together in the room to discuss how things have currently changed, what's currently out there, but also to take a look at what currently is impeding Native art expression and how we can actually go around that or how can we actually change it or what can we do for permitting? And it's that interesting aspect and dichotomy of actually getting biologists, getting refuge managers and native artists to sit down and discuss. And sometimes it might be simple as saying, hey, um, I'd like to teach native art. I go out and harvest my own materials for my workshops for teach being native arts but my knees are getting really bad because I'm now in my 70s and it's getting harder and harder to actually go up in this one particular area where I used to go harvest spruce roots. Do you know another area that has nice sandy soil <laughs> that I can get nice straight spruce roots because you're doing inventories and research of spruce trees throughout Southeast Alaska. Do you know a spot that I can get a lot because I have a work group coming up? And yeah, it's something simple like that isn't necessarily going in and changing all the laws and regs. It's also establishing connections and collaboration between artists and managers and resource users and providing that information. Teresa, thank you so much. I, I feel the hopefulness and the energy that you have for this cause. And um, would, would you be comfortable sharing your email if people want to um, talk to you about this? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's just a TM Wolstead, so W O L D S T D at gmail.com. So TM Wolstead at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And um, I will paste the link to this survey for anybody who's interested. You can also contact us at Benell Street Art Center and Homer info at benellarts.org. Looking forward to having you in Homer in October. Oh, we'll yes. also be exhibiting <laughs> some of these amazing works that you've shared with us. Thank you.